Ready. Aloha nui loa. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Wow. So just a reminder to um, everyone here, there's, we've been having a, a, another weekend retreat um, that we've been doing as part of a month long kind of period of intensive practice. This weekend has been focused on Vedana, our feeling tone. And so we've got a number of folks who've been sitting all weekend and practicing with us. And then we also have a, a bunch of folks here who are for the regulars for the Sunday sitting. Um, and we're happy to have everyone welcome you. Just again, that reminder for the Sunday sitting that we won't do a guided sitting today um, or a Q&A. It'll just be the, the talk as it will be for the two more weekends to follow through August before we get back to our normal schedule in September, our normal program. Feel free to take a look at your yogi comrades. Check in with who is here in the quilt with you. Really nice to see all of you. Mm. Yeah. I love how some people are so sleeveless where it's really hot and have coats on where they're cold. It's my favorite. <laughs> it's so cool. Oh. Great. So tonight's uh, talk will continue on this theme of Vedana that we've been focused on for this weekend as part of this um, framework that the Buddha offered of uh, satipatthana, you know, of, of four establishments or foundations or um, fields in which it's considered very uh, fruitful to bring this quality of attention of mindfulness starting with the body, then into Vedana, feeling tone. Going on into mind, mind states, and then into dhammas, which are translated in different ways, but um, you can think of it as everything that might not be contained in those first three uh, fields. But also a lot of these um, phenomena that, that have to do with how we observe things unfolding, how we um, understand the relationship of one moment of experience to another and the process of liberation or the process of suffering and entanglement and um, what leads to what. And the Vedana, this quality of feeling tone is is very resonant, I think, with that theme as well. It's just, it has this, it's such a pivotal aspect of experience. And for something as subtle and, and uh, fleeting as it is, this basic quality of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone that arises with every moment of consciousness, of body consciousness, of mind consciousness, of seeing consciousness, hearing, smelling, tasting consciousness, this quality of pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral um, in greater or lesser intensity arises. And in some ways it can seem amazing that that's put on equal footing to mind or body in terms of where the Buddha emphasized the value of, of bringing our attention but the more you look and the more folks pay attention and observe and try to understand, it's, it becomes so clear what a pivotal role Vedana has in our lives. And in particular, the aspects of our lives that lead to more entanglement and more suffering 
or the aspects that lead to more liberation, more freedom, more peace and happiness. This um, past week was the peak of the Perseid meteor showers. And um, ever since I can remember, I've always thought about, <laughs> I've always wanted to watch them, you know, and many of the years in which I've made the effort to do it, it ends up being cloudy or something like that, it's sort of my classic meteor shower karma. Um, but this year, I just, um, I kind of just decided if I wake up in the middle of the night at all, I'll try to see if I can get out of bed and go out and, and, and check it out and just see whatever hour it is, what might be available because it was said to be a good year because the, it was just that crescent moon was setting pretty early. So deep into the night, it was really dark sky and optimal. And um, it was great. It was really, you know, there's something I think of like where waking up at an odd hour and committing to a little bit of wakefulness and um, doing something a little bit out of our routine is is often kind of special and meaningful. And so um, if a little uncomfortable as well. But I went out and lay down a pretty good view, you know, and it was been really clear most of the nights. And um, I think I got up maybe three nights to do it. And uh, just amazing to to go through this process of getting out there and being willing to kind of go through the discomfort and the sleepiness and um, for the sake of, you know, something special and going out and you know, there really were quite a few uh, meteors, falling stars, shooting stars. And it was very clear the Milky Way was out there and the Jupiter and Saturn are pretty high this that hour, this time of year, and really bright. Jupiter is super bright. And, um, you know, something fun about the unexpected but anticipatory excitement, right, of looking and waiting and waiting and looking and seeing and enjoying. And also just <laughs> amazing to see the, the, the very subtle suffering in it. These, these ways in which I could start to see that, you know, I would see a, a shooting star and it would be, you know, uplifting but very quickly, it would feel like not enough. You know, like I would maybe just sort of see it out of the corner of my eye. You know, it wasn't like head on or, so it was just sort of like, oh, I, I kind of got there late or it wasn't really dramatic, you know. Or, uh, uh, once in a while, you know, you'd see a really bright one. Um, and then also just this sense of, of, of fleetingness, you know, of like, oh, it's there and then it's gone. And this really sense uh, in the heart of just, not it not being enough, uh, each each one, and then the moments in between of like boredom or just wanting, you know, this expectation that was not relaxed exactly, you know, it was, uh, you know, uh, you know, a little this tension of of expectation of wanting. Maybe the next one will be so great. You know, maybe maybe it'll happen quickly. Maybe a bunch will come quickly. You know, and 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 the longer of waiting, the the time in between, the more sort of oh, feeling kind of uncomfortable on the concrete, and you know, mosquitoes starting to bother me, and uh, this sort of growing uh, agitation in it, and then to to sort of you know settle back and just amazing to see how this kind of current of discontent could start to form as I'm sitting there looking at just the most beautiful, incredible like night sky of like inky black, beautiful Milky Way, these stars and these planets and this this sense of, of wanting more, you know, wanting wanting deeper satisfaction, a satisfaction that lasted longer and how 
how humorous you have to be to some degree with that, right? That it's that it's like it wasn't the overriding experience. Overriding experience was great. I was doing it. I felt good. I was happy. I did it. The story is easy to tell on that level, and because I think we we're so focused on Vedana and talking about Vedana and this feeling taught us like really seeing how mixed actually emotionally the experience was so much of the time and uh, how poignant that is and how important it is to actually be able to hold that sense of disappointment, that sense of fleetingness with some lightness, some levity and not be distraught, you know, not storm back into the house because there wasn't a, you know, psychedelic, gushing of stars you know through the through the night sky <laughs> it ended up being oh the cold breeze started getting to me and i was out there maybe half an hour and finally i decided it was it was okay to walk go back to bed and not feel like i was leaving the project in, in disappointment which i wasn't but i could see that's that and that question of where how much would be enough right because it's obvious there's never enough that's 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 immediately obvious right to any of us it would never be a satisfying amount of shooting stars or at least not realistically you know <laughs> uh and that even if it was this sort of just flood of just at some point the mind would tire of that right because the mind does tire of that you know that that is what life is like that is what the mind is like it is a constant flow of just miraculous and mysterious phenomena. You know, when we, we come to sit in meditation, we come to try to observe just this sort of vast mystery of, of the intellectually known but not experientially known, of the wonder. What is the mind? What is the body? What are thoughts? What is smell? What is wanting? What is hatred? What is peace? What is pleasant, unpleasant, neutral? And yet we don't relate to it almost ever, most of us, with this sense of wonder, with this sense of awe, right? There's always a sense of waiting for something to happen, right? Coming to our meditation cushion, waiting for something exciting, something that is uh, going to satisfy us, something that's going to prove the effort of sitting there uncomfortable is worth it. You know, it's how we relate to so much in life. Michelle was talking about social media and, you know, just that question of how many likes can you, can you get on something that's really going to, when is that satisfying? I have a friend who's become like a more, like famous, like a famous person. And, you know, so she'll post like whatever and something, and it's just like a hundred thousand likes or whatever, you know? And I was like, is that it? Like, are you, does like, are, is you, are you satisfied? Like, do you feel like there's this, like, you are just filled with affirmation. Like there's no, there's no depletion, you know? And it's like, no, of course not. <laughs> you know, it changes. There's a different thing there, but just how amazing that senses and how and how powerful actually I think that can be for people who are being uh, kind of aware of that. But even just scrolling through news or emails or whatever, just this sense of wait, wanting that thing that's gonna engage us, even as was said, you know, in the question and answer period the other day, even if it's something negative, something that creates tension, there's a sense of a thirst for that, a thirst for the intensity, the excitement. And of course, we bring that same quality to our meditation practice. You know, that's part of what's so powerful and necessary, but also can be humbling in our meditation practice is to see that we might have higher aspirations for our orientation, higher aspirations for um, our relationship to our practice. But in the end, it has to be the same as what it is to everything else, that we have to be confronted with who we are, actually, not this just the version of who we want to be or how we wish the mind was or the heart was, how the body was. That, of course, we come to our meditation practice wanting satisfaction, wanting pleasant experience. Mm -hmm.
not wanting to deal with disappointment, not wanting to surrender to the unpleasant, not wanting to face the truth of anicca, of impermanence, of dukkha, of the suffering that comes from not seeing clearly, of anatta, of non-self, of the sense that there's, even within ourselves, there's no core, stable, solid anything. And this willingness to, to allow the practice to, to deepen our disenchantment with all things, with all life, with all phenomena. But paradoxically, it's dependent upon our wonderment with all things equally, right? It isn't the sense of, oh, stopping looking at the stars, stopping this awe with nature, with reality. But it is seeing, understanding, accepting, releasing the expectation of fulfillment in our hearts from whatever happens internally or externally. And so much of our practice life is this feeling the tension and the intensity and the, the, the pain of that wanting and of that hope for fulfillment. And the slow, <laughs> beautiful, sometimes painful process of starting to let that go, of seeing the places where we're stuck and the pain of that, and the places where we're holding our own hearts, but also the whole world in a prison of our expectations, of our needs. And what a relief that is to let that go. What an opening it is for ourselves and for the world. In the Patta Akasa Sutta, the Buddha said, because just as various winds blow in the sky, winds from the east, winds from the west, winds from the north, winds from the south, dusty winds and dustless winds, cold winds and hot winds, mild winds and strong winds, so too various feelings arise in the body. Pleasant feelings arise, painful feelings arise, neither pleasant nor painful feelings arise. Just as many diverse winds blow back and forth across the sky, easterly winds and westerly winds, northerly winds and southerly winds, dusty winds and dustless winds, sometimes cold, sometimes hot, those that are strong and others mild winds of many kinds that blow. So in this very body, there are various kinds of feelings that arise pleasant ones and painful ones, and those neither painful nor pleasant. But when a bhikkhu who is ardent does not neglect clear comprehension, then that wise one fully understands feelings, vedana, in their entirety. Having fully understood feelings, they are stainless in this very life, standing in the dhamma, with the body's breakup, the knowledge master, cannot be fathomed. So this, of course, understanding of the, the futility that of our happiness being dependent on one wind blowing or another. And the pain of that. And yet that's that equal futility of how the winds blowing internally, right? The elements of earth, air, fire, and water as we experience them in the body. The sense of, of course, we have a preference. Of course, <laughs> pleasant, we prefer pleasant sensations over unpleasant ones. But we also come through understanding, through comprehension, right? Through this ardency, this willingness to go undergo the reality of the arisal of the unpleasant and the passing away of the pleasant, this powerful clarity and liberation that emerges, that's available to us 
of recognizing this body is, is never going to be free of the lack of controllability of this. Painful sensations will arise. Pleasant ones will dissipate. Uh, we will be sick. We will get old. We will die. And so to have our happiness, our sense of stability, our sense of peace be dependent upon that, you can see the ridiculousness of that. But also without judgment, right? We also see the despair in that. We see the anguish in that, the pain of that, of how hard it is to be in a body that is unstable, to be in a world that is unstable, climate that is unstable. It is not to say these things don't matter. They don't have their impact or that the suffering that comes from them isn't real. Or that they might be worth being cared for. (laughs) They might be worth putting energy into attending to the body, attending to the climate tending to the winds, but that that can come out of a place of care, of love, not out of our inability to bear the anguish. And that is a relationship with Vedana, with pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, is the only thing that can bear that fruit, right? This willingness to undergo the challenge of unpleasant, the pain of it, and to see that the mind actually can bear it. The mind is much stronger than we often realize, than we have the experience of. And that strength comes through a surrender and an acceptance and a clear seeing, not through a a willpower, a forcing, a manipulation, uh, not through magic powers, but through wisdom and tenderness. And so this question of our attention and how important our attention is to the quality of Vedana, of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone that arises with every experience, it just, it can't be overstated. Because we can see, and especially as as we start to practice, you start to sensitize to it, we can see how not having a mindful, investigative, interested relationship with Vedana, being oblivious to Vedana, leads to all kinds of suffering. But before that, we see that it is almost, one could say almost entirely the driving force of our attention. Without, with, without mindfulness, without awareness, without trying to observe, our attention is almost entirely controlled by Vedana or dependent upon or manipulated by Vedana. That our attention gets drawn to that which is beautiful, that which is pleasant, and the the longing and the wanting and the craving and the grasping that happens from there. Or we're oriented in a way that our attention goes to the unpleasant, the painful, the negative, right? and the aversion, the fear, the worry, the anxiety that comes from there. Or with the neutral, this neglect, right? The conscious neglect, the the unattentiveness, the um, dismissal, the disregard, the obliviousness. And with that obliviousness comes inevitability. Right? That, that without observation, without seeing, without any sense of that it's something to be observed, the dominoes fall in a very predictable way toward greed, toward craving, toward anger, towards delusion, towards addiction, towards war, right? Towards suffering for ourselves and others. And so then this quality of interest, right? this importance of investigation, of, of the willingness to bear the pain of unpleasant, 
and actually bear what can be the pain of pleasant, right? The anguish that can come from the wanting of it or the despair around it passing. As we've talked about, the fear that can come from neutral, that is, you know, as we've said, sometimes the most terrifying for people, the sense of oblivion, the sense of disappearing, that actually the neutral Vedana is something that we have, many of us have a very hard time appreciating, being interested in, exploring, investigating. And that's really why we begin so much with this encouragement around like the breath, for example, as a primary anchor. This idea of the breath as for many people, not everyone, being uh, basically neutral, right? Not super pleasant, not super unpleasant, something relatively neutral. Or if the breath doesn't work, going into the body, but there's or going into sound. And again, this sense of like trying to find a place where there's like, not a lot of really intense pain, not a lot of very intense pleasure as a principal place for practicing mindfulness, as like the fundamental tool that we have around finding an object and using that as your primary object. It's like we're trying to actually attune to some qualities more in the neutral terrain, more in the neutral territory. And to understand that if we have some capacity there, develop some capacity there, to stay engaged, to be interested, to notice small amounts of aversion, small amounts of uh, uh, pleasure or pain, then we, the heart does start to feel more sense of capacity, greater and greater capacity to deal with more intense expressions of Dukkha Vedana or Sukha Vedana, more intense pleasant or unpleasant sensations. Right, and so this is the, the linchpin of being able to develop, of getting free, of being able to develop equanimity, of being able to develop this, this even the sense of possibility of liberation, right? That, that, oh, the mind doesn't need to relate to pleasant, unpleasant, neutral in these habitual ways, in these deeply, profoundly conditioned ways, right? Beyond millions of lifetimes, right, of the evolutionarily conditioned ways of responding to that which might harm us or that which we want, need to survive. So we don't pathologize them, but we also see that the mind can be just as interested in painful experience as it is in pleasant experience, or neither painful nor pleasant experience. And just that is it's everything it's everything to be able to to see that we can be just as interested and because it's interest it's like oh just as mindful just as peaceful just as caring with an experience of pain as an experience of pleasure or as a neutral experience it's like full enlightenment doesn't have to seem like some magical mysterious unattainable religious kind of concept. It's just that, but deeper. <laughs> because the understanding is deeper, because the mind has been through all of the pain, all of the pleasure, all of the neutral that a human being could go through, right? That it understands the extreme and the, you know, uh, and the more neutral range of that. Oh, that there's no fear of pain. There's no belief and satisfaction of pleasure. There's no need for things to be other than neutral. Whatever, whatever may arise, right? That's like, oh yeah, that's all this is, is this deepening, strengthening, building of this very simple capacity to be interested in that which is unpleasant genuinely interested, not trying to manipulate, not trying to control, not trying to, genuinely interested in that which is pleasant 
in a way that also isn't attached to it. Genuinely interested in that which is neutral. A few years ago, we held a short weekend retreat um, on the island of Oahu. An area called um, Hau'ula on the sort of windward side. Some folks here were there. Or Tan and Sun here. They were there, yes. Tan and Sun were there. I can't see who else is there, but it's a true story. And uh, we hadn't been to this place before. It was our first time. It was a Buddhist uh, monastery, uh, really beautiful, and kind of set in this valley. Um, and it was a small, I don't know, probably less than 20 people, probably more like 15 people. And um, it was very rustic. And so on, on the opening night, I was getting ready to give my talk and um, it was, came out of my little yurt and was walking towards the Dhamma Hall, which was, I don't think it really was just an old chicken coop, but it had that feeling. It had, it was just sort of like plywood and exposed beams and chicken, chicken wire as the window screens, right? Not like a very robust <laughs> window screen. And, uh, and I noticed, oh, and it, it sounded like it was going to rain uh, outside. It sounded like it had started raining. So I put on my little raincoat and I walked outside and it wasn't raining, but I started to hear these little tick, 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 tick on my, on my raincoat. And I had heard them on my uh, yurt also. And within a few, you know, I don't know, 50 yards to the Dhamma Hall, it went from a kind of clear, sunset time to the air was just filled thick filled with flying termites that had all hatched in the jungle in the forest <laughs> and were coming out for this big event uh they do this sort of breeding event every so often and so within just a few steps it it, it the, everything was covered in f these flying termites and walked into the Dhamma Hall, and because it had just chicken wire for the screens, the air was full of flying termites in the Dhamma Hall. And all the yogis were covered in termites, and, and the the lights that were on were were like calling the termites, you know. And uh, it was it was wild, right? The sense of like, oh my goodness. And so. Um, we, you know, quickly, as quickly as we could sort of turned off all the lights and everyone sort of <laughs> wrapped themselves in whatever they could. And I gave the opening talk in the total darkness, everyone wrapped in shawls, everyone was covered and just like covered in these crawling, creepy crawling termites. <laughs> and I, and, and to the point where it's like, I couldn't breathe because they were just everywhere. Right. And, um, oh man, it was very intense. And and then the talk was over and it was like, all right, <laughs> like good luck everyone, like good night, you know, we'll just like try to we'll see you in the morning, you know. And of course Tan and so and, and there was another person managing and um, you know, everyone really pitched in to try to like sweep out the termites that are on the floor and get them out of your beds and you know, people to sort of do the best we could to um to manage and I think most people had closed, you know, their, their, where they were sleeping was closed and there weren't, a, you know, a ton of them everywhere in, in, <laughs> in some key places uh, were somewhat protected. And um, just, you know, woke up the next morning and, and basically they had all died, right? This is like a one-time procreation event that happens and then they die. And so, of course, the next morning, therefore, there was just like bazillions of termites everywhere on the ground, and everyone was like cheerfully <laughs> sweeping and cleaning them up and cleaning out the bed linens, and um, it was really incredible. And uh, and uh, we got a note 
from one yogi. Every yogi stayed, except for this one yogi. And she left a note and she just said, I'm really sorry. I am just not enlightened enough to deal with that, <laughs> to deal with thousands of termites crawling all over me all night. And it was like, you know, absolutely like no, no, uh, no hard feelings, no judgment on that. You know, it really was very, an, an extreme experience and, um, could really see how much it tested everyone. And, um, and, and, and the closing circle, and, and, and so you had an interesting range of people who were very experienced yogis, people who had come on many, many retreats. And then some folks who were there, like this was their first retreat ever, right? This was the first like jump into silence for a weekend. And this one young man really at the closing circle was just, um, it was very beautiful. You know, he just, he just, he admitted how hard it was and how just like, really, he just thought he was not going to be able to handle this. It was just like too much and too crazy and just like too overwhelming. But he just tried to practice and he tried to focus on the physical sensations that were actually occurring, right, on his skin. And he said that what he noticed was that actually these sensations were not unpleasant. In fact, they were slightly pleasant, right? This sort of slight kind of like light tickling kind of feeling all throughout the body, like a sort of tingling. And he said it was very powerful to see that actually those sensations were pleasant, mildly pleasant, but that as soon as I started to think about what it was, as soon as I started to think about what was happening, that I was covered in bugs and da, 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 then it would be like, like his mind would just like spin out into this, like, I can't do this. This is crazy. I got to get out of here. I got to run. Da, 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 da. And like, but he saw it, right? He saw that that was just his idea. <laughs> that was just the mind. And that if he was able to stick with it enough, that he could land again. He could come back into this presence that it was okay, that he actually could bear this. And then he could see the agitation in the mind and he would try to watch that. And he would try to watch the fear and the confusion and all of the things that arose and the doubt and then and the energy, you know, and then, and then slowly coming back down into the, into the body, into the direct experience. And he said, I can't, I can, I cannot explain how profound this is for me. He's like, I don't think it'll, ever, it will be clear for a long time of what the impact is, but there's something very powerful in knowing and seeing that difference in seeing that actually this, the experience wasn't unpleasant. It was the mind state that was unpleasant. And that if I could be with the physical sensations and recognize those as they are, then I had a chance of being with the mind states. I had a chance of trying to be in relationship with them, trying to notice the unpleasant, trying to bring compassion, trying to work with it, as we say, right? But it, as long as I was conflating them, it was overwhelming. It was too much. I couldn't bear it. And that, and that immediately understanding that this is true for countless things in his life and in one's life, that this is actually what's happening most of the time for all of us. And we made it through, you know, that first night and then the second night we had sort of like all the strategies of putting out like big lamps out in the field so that it would draw them away. And, you know, anyway, but they didn't come back the next night. But what we found was that during the metta sitting around two in the afternoon after lunch, um, that on the weekends, their neighbors open up a um, firing range at the center. And so come we start sitting down it's literally it's like as i start to try to guide love and kindness practice you just hear like clack, 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 clack. you're like huh weird and, da, da, da. and then within five minutes it's just like and you're in this valley and there's just like explosions just like echoing through the valley it just sounds like a war is happening next door right and um it just Luckily, by that time, we had made it through the termites. So it gave people a sense of like of what we were doing and how to do it and that it was like we were capable of doing this. And not only were we capable of feeling some sense of equanimity, that we could actually find a connection to caring. 
amidst the sounds of, of, of gunfire and of, of warfare, right? And all that that might evoke in anyone's heart, right? Depending on the conditions of our lives, of our upbringing, of our, you know, all kinds of reasons in which why those sounds may be very difficult to be with, with equanimity, never mind with tenderness. And so this ability again of like when to move in, when to move out, how to, how to find the sensitivity to like, okay, there's sound. Is it the sound that's unpleasant or is it the idea of what I'm hearing that's unpleasant? Is it my projection onto who these people are? Uh, is it a memory of something else, right, that happened in my life? And, and the amazing ability, you know, of yogis, of people who are dedicated, of people who want to be free, to try to undergo some of that hardship, try to understand, try to see the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, try to see the difference between mind and body in these entanglements so that we don't have to be oppressed by these conditions that are out of our control. And so that, that the question is never, are we enlightened enough to go through what we're going through? It's, how deeply do we want to be enlightened? Are we, are we, do we want it enough to go through what we're going through? And there are limits. There are definitely times where we will, you know, Michelle's story about, you know, being told, you know, not by a monastic teacher, right, but to sit in her room for, never leave her room for however many days because it's like no actually it's not helpful like there's all these things of like you're not we're not trying to increase the temperature we're not trying to increase the pressure in our practice we're not we're not like sitting in like more difficult postures right we're not like trying to create more pain or tension so that we get to the edges of our you know intensity and try to practice there no you know we don't wish for these kinds of experiences for yogis on their, on their retreats, you know? But we also can recognize that there are times where a certain degree of intensity can inspire us to a deepening engagement with what's happening for us, right? A deepening understanding that this is suffering and we want to be free from suffering. We want to understand the nature of it. And as long as it's inclining towards more of these qualities of attention, of mindfulness, of interest, of tenderness, of care, of curiosity, then it can be considered a wholesome endeavor. But when it starts to sort of bleed into, oh, forcing the attention, we're not good enough, or I'm gonna beat this, or arrogance, or not, whatever it might be, that feels like actually ends up just recreating the dynamics of greed, hatred, and delusion, then yes, we would say, okay, time to back off, time to take a break, time to try to work with the conditions. Even though the freedom we're talking about is beyond conditions, try to work with the conditions, try to, try to do a little bit of tinkering with, okay, what's happening in the body, changing the posture, bringing the attention somewhere else, um, et cetera. And then what do we do with the conditions that we really can't change? I think I'll, I'll just say that like, so it is part of this is the important understanding of why as we next weekend, we go into an exploration of chitta, of mind, you can start to see just how important this is as a transitional, Vedana is as a transitional experience between them, between body and mind, and a place for helpful discernment. Because often what we will find is that the physical 
um, unpleasant experiences are not always, but often not nearly as hard as the mental anguish, the emotional anguish uh, of unpleasant emotional feeling tone, mind feeling tone, Vedan on the mind. And so that is this sort of other level. Of course, we've been more focused on like the exploration of it in the body as we've come from Kaya Nipasana, this, this question of, of Vedana, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral feeling tone in the body and physical experience. And of course, it's in every experience and including the mind and that it is something that's so important and so um, humbling, right? That, that, that it is around emotional pain um, in which it's much harder to see, it's much more fleeting, it's much more quick. It's the, the, the unpleasantness of, and the experience are, feel so in, intertwined um, that it can be hard to, to disentangle them and the emotional response to the emotional pain. And the, you know, these places of deep wounding, of karmic knots, of trauma, of, of remorse, right? Where people have harmed us or where we have harmed others um, that are very complex and very subtle and very powerful in the mind. Again, it's partly why we start to train in the body as a sort of more gross, less subtle, uh, sometimes more obvious, more apparent, but that the, the development is then also to start to see, oh, you know, unpleasant feeling tone in the mind, pleasant feeling tone in the mind. Where are there ones that are painful? Where are there ones that are really feel like they're part of unwholesome mental patterns? Where are ones that feel like they're part of really beautiful mental qualities? Because there is, it's not that pleasure is wrong or immoral, right? It's definitely not that pain is wrong or immoral. These things are phenomena. And yet we can start to see that the mind's relationship to them, what causes them to arise, what hooks us in, do have moral aspects, right? Do have moral dynamics, results, and impulses that are necessary to explore and to feel into and to be... Um, open to and sensitive to, to try to understand carefully, right? Because it's so sensitive, because we're mostly trained habitually to respond to Vedana out of, out of conditioning versus observe it. Oh, can we observe mental anguish? Can we observe mental wanting, longing, craving? Can we observe delusion? Can we observe, uh, you know, spacing out? Can we observe all of these things? And again, this reminder that it's like this ability to observe it irregardless of its pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral quality, regardless of if it's in the body or in the mind or in seeing or hearing or smelling. This is the doorway. This is how we deepen this ability to be with all phenomena unconditionally unconditional peace, unconditional love. It's also important to see, I'll just say briefly that like, that it's also technically an important part of the path in terms of the development of concentration, in terms of the development of um, uh, the factors of awakening. And so, you know, when you, you bring mindfulness, when you're talking about the seven factors, you bring mindfulness, uh, that mindfulness builds uh, interest, investigation, right? This capacity of, of investigation, which builds energy. This idea of like, you, you sort of, these things start to build on one another and we also apply them with some kind of, you know, volitional uh, intent. Being able to observe, trying to observe pleasant, unpleasant and neutral feeling tone with as much equality is a fundamental part of that, the, the next um, factor of awakening, of, of PT, of rapture, of engrossment. It is in that experience of PT that the mind is able to supersede uh, this pleasure pain syndrome, 
as I know Michelle calls it. I don't know if other use that phrase, but it's very helpful, right? This idea that we're stuck in this dance between pleasure and pain and, and our, our whole emotional world is entangled in it versus if we start to be able to observe them equally with, with equal genuine interest, that is a, a, a force toward and a result of PT, of rapture, of like this, this engrossment with whatever's happening right that it's like the this fixation on our preference for things dissipates and dissolves for some period of time and that there's a full engagement in that range of pleasant unpleasant and neutral and that it's that quality of pt that is said to uh relax the mind and that the mind relax relaxes the body and that the the body relax gladdens the mind and that the gladdened mind leads to tranquility the next factor of awakening calm concentration equanimity so then you go into these next right that we, we build into this and equanimity as you know such a profound aspect of the mind's capacity and result of the path so to really see that even technically in the tradition to understand that this willingness to engage in Vedana, engage in feeling tone, and the ability to start to relate to it with some degree of equanimity. Of course, these things are not just linear. They, they fold in, develop one another in other dimensions. That it is key to that process of, of going from the energizing to the calming factors of awakening. And that it develops kanti, right? Patience, forbearance, something that is so esteemed in the, the, the tradition and in, in so many ways. And I think it's sometimes, uh, I mean, any one of these things I could say is like, this is the hardest thing. <laughs> this is one of the hardest things. The willingness to undergo hardship and to not seek resolution in the projection of responsibility for that outwardly or inwardly. It's, it is it's everything we think of as sainthood. To be harmed and not to harm back, to not blame those who have harmed us, to see suffering in the world, to see inhumane action, and to not then respond inhumanely. It's maybe what I'd say is it's one of the hardest things to see ourselves capable of that can feel so foreign, so other, right? Because we also, in this process, are confronted so humblingly with the opposite, with, of course, the total understandable of blaming someone for causing us stress or blaming the conditions of the world for being unfair, because they are. And people do, right? It's not that it's wrong from the social view. And that is, I think, what's very hard for us spiritually is to sort of also disentangle sometimes our spiritual goal and spiritual method with our hopes for the world and our, and our lives in the sort of more narrative sense. The Buddha said, monks, even if bandits were to carve you up savagely, limb by limb, with a two-handled saw. I don't know why a two-handled saw would be worse than a, a one-handled saw, but it sounds it's like even more intense. <laughs> the person among you who let their heart get angered, even at that, would not be doing my bidding. Even then you should train yourselves. Our minds will be unaffected 
and will say no evil words. We will remain sympathetic with the mind of goodwill and with no inner hate. We will keep pervading these people with an awareness imbued with goodwill. And beginning with them, we will keep pervading the all-encompassing world with an awareness imbued with goodwill, abundant, expansive, immeasurable, free from hostility, free from ill will. That is how you should train yourself. We have this paradox, I think, in our practice where we, we, we have to have really high standards and we can only stay healthy with very low expectations of ourselves and others around us. And it's very, I feel like this is the place where so much comes to a head in terms of where we justify our anger, where we justify our opinions and our views, by self included. And yet, where can we sort of, where do we have the ability at least to, to say, okay, there's righteousness in our indignation at times. This person did this and it caused harm to someone, to me, to people, whatever. We did this and it caused harm. Like there is that version of the truth which has its place and has its um, role to play in our lives and in our social world and in our social dynamics. But to not confuse that with the method and the means, the evolution and the finality of our spiritual lives and our spiritual goals. to see that this capacity for sainthood is in all of us. We all have it because any time any of us have had any single moment of experience of unpleasant sensation, and even if we felt the tension, the not wanting, but then we saw it clearly and we relaxed around it. Unpleasant in your little toe. That experience is the same. That if we had that, if we had an experience of pleasure, but did not get consumed with it, were able to watch it dissipate without going into agony or, or seeing the pain of that and caring about ourselves, not losing connection with this awareness imbued with goodwill, abundant, expansive, immeasurable, free from hostility, free from ill will, then we know it's possible. We know it's possible for any of us. And it's only possible through this willingness to keep going through it, to keep seeing it, to keep bearing the intensity, the forbearance, the patience, the courage, the mindfulness, the interest, all of these beautiful qualities that are developed and cultivated in our willingness to observe Vedana, feeling tone go through the contractions and expansions and tensions and releases in the heart so that we understand. We understand it and we understand the role that it plays in our suffering and in our liberation. Let's just sit for a moment.
So Sunday sitters, thank you for joining us. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday where we'll be doing a similar program. It'll be on Chitta, the mind. And for those participating in the retreat, we'll have our, our closing session in half an hour with the metta chant and sitting. <laughs>